Monster Professor. Welcome to The Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, film, games, folklore, culture, and beyond. I'm your host, Josh Woods, author, editor, professor, and monster expert. And we continue a kickoff to an awesome new year of Monster Professor, the podcast. With today's guest, I'm really excited about talking with him. It's Dr. Michael Drought himself. Um, You might know him as I do from his work on Tolkien, on his work on Beowulf, and his work on the combo, as in Tolkien's work on Beowulf. Um, He put together the definitive book on that back in 2002, which won awards, uh, Beowulf and the Critics by J.R.R. Tolkien. You might know the J.R.R. Tolkien encyclopedia scholarship and critical assessment he's the editor of that if you're into Tolkien scholarship you know of Tolkien studies he's one of the founders of it we talk about that a little bit as well Um, but he also does work on uh, other writers such as Ursula K. Le Guin and on language and liberal arts more broadly you might have known his audio lectures which are awesome away with words Um, one on how to think liberal arts and their enduring value. And today we get into Balrogs. We get some answers to questions that I've never really been able to figure out about monsters and Beowulf, such as Grendel and Grendel's mother. We even get down into some fascinating new facts about, well, new to me anyway. (laughs) I guess they're old facts, but we get into some fascinating facts about the dragon and Beowulf. So I've uh, cornered the expert on these things and got some answers out of them. And man, it's cool. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. So now I bring you Conversation with Dr. Michael Drought. First of all, Dr. Michael Drought, thank you so much for coming on The Monster Professor. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm always happy to talk about monsters and Tolkien and fantasy and anything like that. Yeah, it's a it's a huge honor and a and a pleasure for me. I've been a fan of yours for quite some time and I think a lot of listeners will either know you as one of the one of the planet's top Tolkien experts or one of the planet's top Beowulf experts, or one of the planet's top expert on the combo. Of... I was going to say, they kind of go together, because <laughs> Tolkien was the the very top Beowulf expert uh, on Earth for most of his life. So they, they have a nice, uh, they fit together pretty well. Yeah, and so, and, you know, you, and you've been kind of a, a pioneer of, I, you know, in my mind at least, but I think we have the records to prove it, a pioneer in, in getting people looking at Tolkien's Beowulf studies even more seriously, but also, you know, as a, as one of the founders of Tolkien studies, really, really bringing Tolkien into, you know, serious scholarship. And I think, you know, I don't think anything beats Tolkien studies as far as a literary review. Um, so like you've, you've essentially turned the love of this ancient and fantastical monster filled world into a career. So perhaps we could start a little bit biographical with you and find out what got you in love with Tolkien and Beowulf in this world so much that uh that you made a whole career and a life out of it well i i i owe a lot to you know to tolkien himself uh which i'll explain in a sec how that that worked out and also uh to my father so back in when i was like family lore said i was four but i can't actually get those numbers to work out so i think i was six but (laughs) whatever (laughs) um well actually i can go back even further when i was like two years old i guess my dad had um bought the the box set of the hobbit and the lord of the rings with the barbara remington crazy covers the ones with the emus and the bulbous fruit that <laughs> told me like what on earth is this and didn't the artist actually read the books and the answer was no she actually <laughs> she didn't <laughs> commission to paint it and someone described sort of what happened you know there's like frogs coming out of a volcano and just amazing 
things. And then supposedly I would stand up at my crib because it was taped on the spare bedroom wall in my uh, grandmother's house and point at it and say, what that, what that? And I was fascinated by black riders. So that's what my family interpreted. I'm wondering if I was just saying, what on earth is this like LSD painting on the wall here? <laughs> bulbous fruit and emus and and all these other you know weird things um so that sort of maybe primed it and then i think when i was about six years old i got uh really really sick with with pneumonia and my dad went out to the grocery store and because i was out of school for so long or just like you know just stuck in the house and and he came back with the the tolkien books and started reading The Hobbit, and I just wouldn't let him stop. You know, he, he every time that he was able to to read to me, because he was a doctor, so he was working a lot of you know his internship and and residency back at the seventies when you know they worked every day and every other night, so you're like on for thirty six hours, off for twelve, craziness. Jeez. But when he was you know home, he would read the The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, and when we got to the end, we just have to start right over again. And that went on for years that, oh. that just kept reading the Lord of the Rings all the time. So it's something that I loved and, and grew up with. And then, um, you know, in the, in the eighties, in, in when I was in, in high school, uh, I discovered Dungeons and Dragons. I got into interested in Dungeons and Dragons and, um, I started writing my own dungeons and putting Tolkienian stuff in them, you know, so, uh, because, you know, you can't actually, well, there wasn't actual like Middle Earth stuff in Dungeons and Dragons. I found out later because of the lawsuit against, uh, Gary Gygax and so forth, but I could make up my own. And so, you know, I had where we had to find the Ellen Dilmir or we had to, um, you know, find the scepter of Anuma, Anuminas when it had been hidden in a dungeon by orcs somewhere and, and, <laughs> you know, did that. And then I kind of, not so much, it's, interest faded away. I had other things I was, I was doing and things I was, uh, interested in, uh, once I went away to, to college and did a little, you know, like, well, I think that was when the Treason of Isengard volume came out in the history of Middle Earth and I, I read that and I would read the Silmarillion regularly and the, I read the Lord of the Rings every year in one way or another, but didn't think of it as a career. And it really wasn't until my, uh, I already had my undergraduate degree from Carnegie Mellon. I got a degree in journalism from Stanford and I was at the University of Missouri for creative writing and uh I had to take an elective like a, a, a English you know elective in addition to the creative writing classes and there was old English offered and the course description by um professor John Miles Foley ended with the words West Thu Hall I'm like I know that <laughs> So I signed up for the, for the course and the first day of class, I'm like, okay, I want to do that. I want to be Dr. Foley. I want to be a professor. I hadn't thought that before. I was, you know, I was going to be James Joyce, but it turned out there were no James Joyce job openings when I graduated. So, <laughs> um, and my liver was not strong enough either to, uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, so I wanted to, I wanted to be Professor Foley. I started studying with him. I switched over from creative writing to, to English. I, um, uh, focused on, on old English and, uh, worked with, with him. He was the head of the Center for Studies in Oral Tradition. And then, um, he said, like, based on what you are interested, uh, Mike, you need to go study with my friend, uh, Alan Franson at, um, Loyola Chicago. And so I did and got my PhD working with, uh, with Alan. Uh, and interestingly enough, even though Tolkien had brought me in, uh, at that particular time in academia, I was told flat out by my advisor and by other people, don't talk about the Tolkien stuff. No kidding. So, really? But don't put that in your dissertation. Like, don't, you know, cause I had occasionally things like, oh, this mashes with the Lord of the Rings and, you know, this, and, and they're, don't, don't say that. You'll look frivolous. You'll look like you're not, uh, a serious, uh, scholar, uh, but are instead some kind of like, you know, Tolkien nerd or whatever. And then I was, uh, at the Bodleian Library at Oxford doing, doing research. And I wanted, I, I thought for my dissertation chapter, one, one chapter of my dissertation, I wanted to talk about Tolkien's famous 1936 essay, Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics, where Tolkien completely changed the face of Beowulf studies. And even if he'd never written The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, that essay would still be like the most important essay in our field 
uh, he published it before he published The Hobbit. So, you know, it wasn't influenced directly by his literary reputation. And, um, and, in, and in relation to the monster, uh, podcast, the whole thing is that he said the monsters aren't a, a, an embarrassing, like, little thing in Beowulf. They're central. They convey the theme and so forth. So yeah. I wanted to look at if there were any drafts of, that material or corrections or anything to see how he was, you know, tweaking his language and, and getting there. I was going to be in Oxford anyway. So, um, I arranged to, to look at, at that material and very kindly, the, uh, Tolkien estate and the uh, Bodley library of modern papers gave me permission to, to look at it as a, as a junior researcher. And they bring this stuff out to you, by the way, when you do research at modern papers, or at least when you used to, there's this giant, beautiful Duke Humphreys medieval library, the most, you know, gorgeous thing. And then Modern Papers is across the street, and it looks like one of, like, the Saruman sheds built with <laughs> ugly yellow bricks. So, like, the light was, you know, flickering, fluorescent. It was about 54 degrees. I had to keep going to the restroom and holding my hands under the hot air to get <laughs> the back. You know, so it wasn't very glamorous, like I hoped. But they bring out this big, like, banker's box kind of thing and open it, and there's the carbon... Carbon paper trans, uh, typescripts for Beowulf the Monsters and the Critics with Tolkien's handwriting correcting things. And then I start digging down through the box and I see that there's these four thin bound volumes, like almost like notebook sized. And as I start going through them, I'm like, oh my God, this is a whole book. This is an entire, uh, you know, book about, um, the Monsters and the Critics that Tolkien just excerpted to make this famous lecture. And, uh, that was shocking and exciting. And, and just to, to compress the story a little bit, Christopher Tolkien and the estate gave me uh, permission to quote the material in my dissertation. And then after I got my PhD, they, uh, gave me permission to do an edition, uh, of the text, which I mean, amazing as a junior scholar and everything. And I'm working with my academic heroes, you know, work. They let me get the microfilm made of it. And I, and I did that edition of Beowulf and the Critics. And, um, when that was in press and I guess like rumor of it had gotten around somehow, I got an email from Doug Anderson, Douglas Anderson, who did the annotated Hobbit mm -hmm. and says like, I know, I understand working with the Tolkien estate about copyright and all the things that you had to agree to about not leaking things and everything, but I'm coming out with a new edition of the annotated Hobbit. It would really help me to see your Beowulf, uh, book, but I completely understand if the, if you say no, and I I really had loved the annotated Hobbit, so I just took a gamble and just emailed the whole thing to Doug, which could have blown up in my face. <laughs> but instead, we we became friends. We we ended up talking a lot, and sometime in the in the fall of 2001, we were talking about Tolkien and Beowulf stuff, and uh, on the phone, and he said, oh, "Well, I've just always thought like we really needed a journal like Tolkien studies, you know, because you have." Uh, Malorn, but Malorn is kind of like Middle Earth, you know, it's focused, it's focused on Middle Earth, or it was then, it's actually now Malorn like covers everything. But at that point, Malorn was kind of focused on like in Middle Earth stuff. And Mythlore was Tolkien, but also lots of other stuff. And so Doug was like, I always thought we, you know, should have a journal Tolkien studies, but I don't know how you'd go about doing that. I'm like, let's found it. And he says, well, then we need to bring in my friend Verlin Flieger. And that's how I met uh, Verlin. And we had a number of talks and we decided to to go for it. We didn't have a publisher. We didn't have a contract or anything else like that. And uh, we started soliciting Scott, Tom Shippey and and uh, Gergai Naji and, and a number of other people that we knew, like we'd heard good work at conferences or stuff like that. And so we had the first volume of it done. And then it like publishers just wouldn't take it. Like we said, Verlin had thought Kent State since they published her stuff. They're like, no, nah, no, we're not interested. And like Greenwood wasn't interested in it. And I finally, I'm like, we're going to have to publish it ourselves because we accepted these papers. It's going to be really embarrassing if we don't publish it. People will be mad. So I spent a big chunk of one summer learning how to do it in design and laying out the whole thing and designing it and getting it all ready. And then I was just trying to figure out how we would afford to, you know, print it. And I was at the International Society of Anglo-Saxonists conference in, uh, 2003. I was talking, talking to a guy named Pat Connor, who was a professor of Anglo-Saxon at West Virginia. And he said, yeah, I just become, became the head of West Virginia University Press. And you know the craziest thing, Mike? He's like, 
We don't make any money on any of the books we publish. They are barely break even. The only thing we make any money to keep the press going on is the journals. I did not expect that. And I'm like, huh. hey, Pat, you want another journal? <laughs> He's like, well, well, what would it be on? I'm like, on oh, Tolkien, Tolkien studies. And now, now we're at 2003. So like the Peter Jackson films are starting, you know, and, and he's like, Oh, I, I think we probably could, you know, sell, sell that. Um, well, like, you know, uh, yeah, let's talk about it more. And I reached into my bag, took out a CD and handed it to him. That's how long ago it was. It was all on CD. <laughs> and he's like, you're kidding, right? I'm like, no, it's ready to go. You just have to, you know, print it. And that was how it happened. And then, you know, there was the combination of like the, I had my Beowulf edition. We started, uh, Tolkien studies. The Peter Jackson movies were so much even more successful than anyone had ever imagined. And then weirdly enough, the pop culture interest in the Lord of the Rings somehow like justified it more to academics. Where you'd think it would be the opposite. Like, it, like when I was starting out, it was all like, oh, it's frivolous and hobbits and blah, blah, elves. How could you read a book about elves and so forth? You know, one professor at Missouri said, you know, why well, teach them in class what they can read on the beach in the summer? <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. But then when it became such a pop culture phenomenon, of course, it was like, oh, well, you know, uh, we need to critique this uh, or we need to analyze it or at least it'll bring students into our classes. And then from, from there, it's, it's just, it's, it's expanded. And weirdly, about six, seven years ago, I got asked to be on a dissertation, uh, be the outside reader on a dissertation committee. And the, the guy was doing a dissertation on, uh, Tolkien and, uh, Charles Kingsley, who wrote The Water Babies, like a, a Victorian. And he was arguing, and I think pretty convincingly that Tolkien fit into that tradition, even though Tolkien was quite a number of years later. It was a good, interesting dissertation, but as I worked through it, and more importantly, as I read this guy's Vita and talked to him, I'm like, you're an Anglo-Saxonist, aren't you? Like, that's <laughs> what you do. Well, why'd you do a dissertation on Tolkien? And he's like, oh, because I want to get a job. <laughs> so the world had turned completely upside down, right? Where, like, I had to hide my Tolkien love. He had to pretend to have it to, to get <laughs> get a job uh and so you know that's uh that's kind of an interesting thing how it's how things turn around and now i sometimes have conversations with you know junior scholars and grad students and they're like um yeah well you know i just don't know how do you get a job if you do something like really technical and you know alfrich's homilies and manuscript studies and you know how don't you have to do fantasy or tolkien and i'm like oh boy the world has changed <laughs> Yeah, and nope. actually, I think you, I, and I think you had a big part in that at a, at a little, uh, two year college where I teach in Illinois. Um, when my colleague and I decided, let's try to get a Tolkien literature class going here at the 200 level, because, you know, the worst they're going to do is tell us no, and they most likely will tell us no, or the state of Illinois will, sh will stop it or something. Um, and one of the things we were going to rely on is like, look, hey, Tolkien Studies is a legitimate academic journal. And that's proof that this is a real uh, this is a real field of study for real classes. And we encountered zero re resistance whatsoever. Everybody was really excited about it. It was one of the fastest uh, things I think the state of Illinois ever approved. <laughs> and so, um, so I was I was shocked as well to find it went so smoothly. But I but I think it's due in large part uh, to folks like you who were taking risks with that stuff early on. I mean, they told you not to do it in grad school and you did it anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah, though I was I was more like I I kind of I kind of now wish I'd been more open, you know, or done more of what I wanted to do and not taken out the quotation from Frodo and Moria from the dissertation and stuff. <laughs> um, but uh you know, it it um it, it is interesting how that and part of it is just English departments have and reasonably so gotten scared about their enrollments. Um and another part of it is right is when people went and opened up the literary canon in the 80s and the 90s, um, they weren't intending to let Tolkien in, but they opened the door. So, you know, the door's open now, and, and mm -hmm. you, you can walk in with whatever you people want to study. Um, and, and my whole point in Tolkien studies, and, and I, I really appreciate that you, you said, you know, what you said, because we've just tried to be, like, logically, academically rigorous about it, um, you know, and not 
just like, you know, publish our friends and stuff like that. So not in the sense, you know, some people were like, oh, well, geez, you know, Mythlore has like fan art stuck in it. And Malorn has, you know, my my painting of Galadriel or my poem about this. But, you know, the, the academic stuff in those journals was really good, too. Yeah. It was just mixed in. And I have nothing but respect for fan culture anyway, because th- that's often the people who know the most um, and can save you from dumb errors are, you know, people who've done like costume play or written fan fiction because they know everything down to the most minute detail. So I don't look down on that. But to deal with the academic establishment, we sort of had to be, you know, as stodgy, straight and narrow as as we could be at first. And I'm glad it kind of um, it it worked. It worked that way. And it, and it helped that, at, you know, first it was Doug Anderson, um, who knows absolutely everything seemingly about the publication history of every book. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> and, you know, and he also knew all the ins and outs of little, you know, things and where variations and variants and who to ask and who to get to review. And then Verlin, who, you know, when no one got a job as a Tolkienist, I mean, she wrote a dissertation on Tolkien in 1975. And, you know, a, a, a professor at Maryland, just by sheer force of will and brilliance, I, I think I've joked that I have worked with Verlin now for 18 years and I have never won an argument. Um, <laughs> or even though she's always like sort of seems like she's just giving in and agreeing and being sweet and nice. And then somehow I look up and like, wait, we just did it your way. What? what <laughs> um, and then when Doug moved on from Tolkien studies, uh, David Bratman, you know, stepped in and David has been like central to the MythCon community, the Mythopoeic Society. And, uh, you know, he reads like everything published every year and he writes the amazing year's work and, you know, has, has developed a whole uh, set of, uh, reviewers and, and, um, people who will summarize all the, all the material there. So we really did try to build something, um, that was rigorous. So it's, it's, it's good to hear that it, uh, it comes across that way because the, the old guard was pretty, uh, down on Tolkien. And, and by the way, I've, I've got, uh, I was really excited to get a paper accepted in Tolkien studies recently, but I think it should be known that I had nothing to do with this podcast. It's not like <laughs> I, I bribed no, no, you with the podcast. Or you never paid for, uh, you know, before the, the paper. Um, but it's a good, we have a lot of like good, I'm really happy with how the 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 um the next volume has have shaped up uh yeah. already too. It's a mix of of things and we've had great support from the Tolkien estate from some letting us reprint some of the things that were impossible to get um you know th- yeah. that like the, some of his materials and publishing some bits and pieces of unpublished things like the st- story of Kulervo before they decided to do the whole um book and then we have a a set of outside anonymous reviewers you know and you don't get anything for that obviously and but they do an incredible job yeah. of, of you know of, of giving details i mean I, I i'm always amazed at how many uh little things can be put together to really make a, a paper come together yeah, and I um, you know, since we're since we're so much on Tolkien right now, I do want to pick your brain as an Anglo-Saxon expert and a man who knows Beowulf because I've got some burning Beowulf questions. But since we've been on Tolkien for a while, maybe I could just jump into a really simple and a really difficult question for you. Out of all the monsters in Tolkien, what would you say is your personal favorite? Ooh, that is a great question because there's a lot of great monsters. <sighs> the Balrog? I was fascinated by the Balrog. I think that the, the Ralph Bakshi movie hurt my view of the Balrog for a while. <laughs> Small and looked like a lion. Um, <laughs> but I really like the, and actually, that though it, it was not at all how I envisioned the Balrog, I thought Peter Jackson's Balrog was pretty great and terrifying and yeah. uh, worked there. I mean, in terms of sheer terror, I will say that growing up, 
I was, of all things, most afraid of the, the goblins in The Hobbit. Oh, yeah. I had nightmares and nightmares about goblins coming out of my closet and grabbing me and taking me down a cave or something when I was, when I was younger. And okay, it didn't help that one time my, my uncle decided it would be really funny if he hid in the closet. <laughs> he needed me to turn out the light and then jumped out. That, that, uh, you know, I mean, on the other hand, you know, the suffering that, that everyone in the family went through, uh, I got them all back. <laughs> The go- <laughs> goblins freaked me out too. <laughs> That's funny. But, um, yeah, the yeah. goblins freaked me out too. I mean, even their song was scary for a kid. You know, the snap, crack, and black guns. You know, they're, it's a really scary sounding song. They're freaky. They're freaky it, monsters. And it and it may be, and I can't remember the scholar's name now. I would, I know her first name's Karen. Um, I will have to think about it. It was in Tolkien studies like two or three volumes ago. Um, she sort of went through all the different verse forms that Tolkien uses. The Goblin poem may be the only example of uh, something called spondaic dimeter. <laughs> spondaic dimeter shouldn't exist, right? Because a spondy is when you have two stressed syllables, yeah. and you really can't make a sentence with lots of stress without any unstressed. But snap, crack, the black, crack, grip, grab, pinch, nab, down. Down to Goblin Town, you go, my lad, is as close as it's possible to get. And she and I couldn't find any other examples anywhere. So that's kind of cool. And then wow. the other poem that they do when they're trapped in the in the tree, yeah. uh, pine trees, is utter. Like I, I, you can't believe it got through into a children's book where it's like uh, till skins crack and eyes. Dark, like it's got really like so you know so their bodies burn up and it describes the goblins are chanting it in like great details. <laughs> the, the goblins are pretty darn scary. Um, oh. Yeah, I think of my like I think my favorite. I mean, personality wise, it's probably Smaug, but I just the Balrog was. Yeah, the Balrog, and I've, and in the book, like the Peter Jackson film, in which he's like a, this molten minotaur kind of thing, like that's freaking awesome. But that was that was not my reading of it. They seem more like you know, like more reasonably sized shadow demons, and and silent at that. And so, but you know, it's but I don't think that would have come across nearly as well on film. I don't know. And that's, and that's the problem, right? Like once you once you see it it's never i mean that's why i actually like jackson so much because it wasn't anything like i thought so i wasn't disappointed in it um the way i was with ralph bakshi's like lion thing um <laughs> because it says something like a mane you know and it's got um vast wings of shadow but it also you know you can kind of i, I so i don't know if you know about the infamous balrog wings uh, <laughs> yeah do they, they have do, wings right? like uh, you know one of the first like usenet crazinesses of like the, you know do balrogs have wings or not and are they real wings and if so why can't it fly back up out of the pit and blah 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 and how large they reach from wall to wall but yet they don't and they're made of shadow and they're not and i mean then that's that's why it's so scary in you know in the in the book but you know, I don't know how you would do that. And I, I agree that they like they're they're that Tolkien was really into that like combination of like fire and darkness, which is hard to film. Yeah, yeah. Or impossible, really, since fire gives off light. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that would, and I and I remember at one point trying to dig through uh, Silmarillion and uh, and every supplemental text I could find to try to get accounts like at the time of the War of the Rings, how many or how many ever, how many Balrogs have we ever had? And and I think I came up with a minimum of just a few. But, I mean, in theory, there could be hundreds of them under every cave out there. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm... I mean, because you have, like, Gothmog, right, the Balrog in the Silmarillion, mm-hmm. and he seems to have, like, a vanguard or other – or there, there's multiple Balrogs that come after Feanor. Yeah. At that point. And also there's the whole, like, when Morgoth opens up Thangorodrim, you know, at the, at the end, Thangorodrim and says, and, and lets the big dragons and the Balrogs and, and, and everything out. But yeah, how many of them were there? And what, 
you know, what, what was that like? And that, that's the kind of thing that like Lord of the Rings online and, um, fan fiction and stuff can do a lot with. Yeah. Are there more of them? Can you come across one? Can you come across one after Sauron has fallen so you can get another monster, you know, <laughs> in there? Um, and, and actually the, the scene, I, I love the Silmarillion and, and cause I, I read it when I was nine years old when it first came out and it was incredibly important to me. And like the scene where the, uh, the Balrogs kill, uh, Fingon. Yeah. Incredibly powerful and stylistically stolen from Beowulf, where, um, you know, Tolkien sets it up and it's like in this, and he says, that was a grim meeting. <laughs> that was called Kuning. There you go. That's the, that's the style that he, uh, he took from there. And, uh, and it works. I mean, and, and it's so horrifying too. And it's like, and his banner, blue and white, they trod into, they trod into the mire of his blood. And, you know, I mean, the Silmarillion stuff is no one like Tolkien for just making, um, you know, you feel hopeless defeat by the bad guys. Yeah. Before I mean, later on. Yeah. And, and, and that point you were referencing out of, uh, out of Tolkien's essay, Beowulf monsters and the critics about, you know, what, like the, the monsters didn't diminish Beowulf. And I think the same could be applied to Lord of the Rings at Silmarillion. Um, as well, it didn't diminish it. It, it deepens and broadens what it, what's possible. And so maybe, maybe we could jump into Beowulf a little bit because it seemed like Beowulf endure, like, you know, you could, if a cynic could argue that, you know, Tolkien in, endures and will continue to for a while because of Peter Jackson and Amazon and, and these things, but, but no such argument can be made for Beowulf. I think it endures more than just its place as like a chronological milestone as being an early English epic in completion. But I think it has something to do with, with it, this, it's striking at something deeper and more meaningful. And I think it has a lot to do with those monsters. And I couldn't really get my head into that until I saw a lecture of yours when you were kind of laying out uh, some meaning behind it. Like it matters that we encounter Grendel first. It's a type of monster. And then it matters that we encounter second Grendel's mother. And then the third and the last being the dragon. So maybe we could just jump into the deep end there. And like, why do, why do these monsters matter? These three stages of monsters matter in Beowulf, do you think? Well, I mean, you put your, you put your finger right on what was the sort of central critical problem in Beowulf. So, you know, one of the things that the Norton anthology or any like history of English literature course does is sort of falsify the history of literature. Cause one of the things we always teach, like, is like whatever comes before influences what comes after. It just makes sense that way. So that's the excuse, you know, and the reason for reading things in some kind of chronological order. But as far as we know, no one read Beowulf between, let's just for round numbers say, between 1100 and, and 1750 or 1780. Yeah. And maybe, you know, later, nobody, and nobody was influenced by Beowulf in that, until after, even after 1815, uh, when the first, uh, you know, modern edition uh, came out. So, like, we didn't really, we could say it's the oldest thing, but of course it's in a language that most people don't read, and it didn't connect up with Shakespeare or even Chaucer. So people wanted to, you know, figure out why is it good if it's good. And for a while that's because of politics. And it was like, it proved it, weirdly enough, and I'm not going to go into all the details of this because it's in, in, in kind of insanely twisted and tangled, but basically it was thought to prove either that the people living in Southern Denmark had always been Danes or that the people living in southern Denmark had always been Germans. Huh. And, and this is why, like, really, the, the, the English weren't that interested in Beowulf at first, but the Danes and the Germans were, because they could each, and both those arguments are terrible, by the way, but, um, <laughs> I mean, the tradition of Beowulf says it's a Danish uh, poem in the Anglo-Saxon dialect, but there is no Anglo-Saxon dialect of Danish. They just, like, Thorkland just made that up, you know, when he... <laughs> 
because it was to prove, you know, oh, we Danes have been living here forever. And then um, so anyway, that that was a problem. And then the other problem was uh, the way that W.P. Kerr, who was Tolkien's foil for his great article later on, W.P. Kerr put it is like, there's just too many monsters. Like there's <laughs> monsters. Homer and there's monsters in Virgil, but they're in their proper place and there's not too many of them. But <laughs> there's like two trolls and a dragon and some sea monsters and too, too many monsters, too many. You know, it's it's embarrassing there. And like that was the, the, people couldn't figure out like what the aesthetic of Beowulf was, either in its own terms or in comparison to anything else, because it's it's kind of digressive. It falls into two or three general parts. There's big chunks of Beowulf that are just flat out repetition. I mean, at line 18, uh, like uh, right around late 1800, the you know sort of towards the second uh, third of the poem, Beowulf just tells the entire story again. <laughs> Everything that just happened. I mean, it's a little bit like Wagner does, but Wagner at least has the excuse that the operas were on different days. And so, you know, yeah. isn't opera, you've got to sing and tell everything happened in operas number one and two. Um, so there's a lot of things like that about about Beowulf. And and so it was mostly thought of it was uh, as Tolkien frames it. And he, he's being a little bit unfair. He's, you know, he's, he's for rhetorical effect. But he's basically saying people looked at it as a quarry for information or as, um, you know, something for history, something for little bits and pieces of well-written lines. But overall, they're like, oh, this isn't, you know, this is a primitive and this is, uh, they don't really know what structure is. And, you know, it doesn't really make sense. And Tolkien's like, whoa, 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 wait a sec, wait a sec. The monsters are actually the central thing. And that's what's fundamentally different from the Iliad and the Odyssey. But it's not by accident. And it's not like because the poet didn't know any better. It's that... He's using those monsters to deal with, uh, you know, certain features of his culture. I don't think Tolkien would have said it that way. Uh, I think he would have said more that, like, certain aspects of human life. Um, you know, he would he was, would be, would be more universal there. But I, I would say uh, certain aspects of Old English culture. And so, uh, so for example, uh, Grendel seems like an extrapolation of some kind of an outlaw of someone who's who's outside the system of social control right i mean at one point it says grendel won't pay wergeld wergeld means man price and it was <laughs> yeah like they were expecting oh, him to like show up in court and pay up for the people he ate <laughs> like does he have money how does he pay you know, I guess he has a giant bag made of dragon skin um, later, but we don't hear that at the beginning. So, like, you know, Grendel's an outlaw. He's called the Mirkstapa, the one who walks around the mark or the edges of of things. He's maddened by the sound of the harps and that they're singing the creation hymn, which my students are always like, wait, wait, wait. Is Grendel Shrek? <laughs> <laughs> See, Grendel, get out of my swamp, you Danes, go away. But, um, <laughs> no, that, that's not it either. Um, it's, it's, and also the, the, the Danish royal house has a problem, um, in other, not in Babel itself that we can easily see, but in other texts and things related that, that we think that show a common oral tradition, the Danish royal house has a real problem with kin killing, with like people killing their cousins, nephews, brothers, or whatever to get to the throne. And Grendel is said to be of the kin of Cain. And of course, Cain is the original kin killer. And the Anglo-Saxon culture, when they converted to Christianity, they didn't really get the whole apple thing. Like, it didn't seem to make a lot of sense to them. Um, as like the source of all evil in the world is because Eve uh, ate the apple and talked Adam into eating it. It's like, what? <laughs> It's an apple, I think. I mean, there's no, you know, but they didn't make a big deal about what they made a big deal about was Cain and Abel, because that made intuitive sense to them in a Germanic warrior culture. The worst thing that you can do is kill a kinsman. Yeah, because you can't atone for it. Like with, with if you kill a, a stranger, as bad as that is, your family can put together like the the where the wergeld the man price. And their family will probably accept it if it shows enough honor and so forth. But you can't do that for, for kin any more than you could pay your left pocket from your right pocket and be better off. 
Yeah. So Grendel kind of represents that, right? He's he comes out of nowhere. He's unkillable, like like kin killing. You just can't ever get rid of it because there's reciprocal revenge. Then there's Grendel's mother, and Grendel's mother is really weird. Like one, the, one of the first things the poet like so Grendel's mother they they kill Beowulf kills Grendel, and then Grendel's mother shows up, takes her son's arm back, kills one guy and drags him off, and that's it. And no one has ever mentioned her before until Beowulf says to, like, uh, Hrothgar, hey, how was last night? Hrothgar is like, don't even ask. Sorrow is rude. Asher is dead. Um, and and then Hrothgar says, oh, yeah, men told me that there were there was another monster. Um, and it was smaller. And it was, like, really the same size as a woman is to a man in terms of monsters and not as scary. Like, again, what storyteller makes the second monster wimpier? Yeah. Um, like it, it needs to escalate, but it doesn't. And th- there, there might be a lot of complicated reasons for that. I think because the poet is totally reworking a folktale pattern that he knew and that the second monster was supposed to be some kind of, uh, necromancer w- wizard magical power thing that looked smaller, but actually was more dangerous. And he sort of does that, but he leaves out all the, you know, what, what I think would be the magic or something like that and just makes it like she just jumps on him. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, I guess like that, I was curious about that too, because they make a deal about clarifying that she seemed weaker and does less, but they never give her a name like Grendel. She's just Grendel's mother. And that suggested to me that maybe the real threat is that she'll just keep producing Grendels until you do something about right. her. Right. Um, but any other, the others are other couple of possibilities too. Uh, I mean, if Mary Dockray Miller, uh, is right, she does have a name and it's Brimwolf. I'm not, I'm not convinced the syntax of the passage is ambiguous, but it could be. So hmm. maybe she does name and Brimwolf would be like the monster from the water, uh, or something like that. Um, and maybe, uh, you know, Tom Shippey's talked about this. Maybe she's sort of like a peg, a peg powler or something like that, like, or a Jenny Green Teeth. Like she's yeah. a, a water tradition monster uh, with William Lawrence thought that she was a waterfall troll, but when they transplanted the story to England, there weren't any waterfalls, so they couldn't have <laughs> waterfall. So they had to have a swamp. Um, and that's complicated. But one thing that seems to be the case is that Grendel eats like lots and lots of people over 12 years. She takes one, cuts his head off, grabs her son's arm and runs and so in that way, I would say that she's sort of like an evil or a negative avenger, where Grendel's just a, you know, a, Grendel's an evil warrior or an evil berserk or something like that. She's an avenger, and she's treated differently because, like, we actually, even though she's a monster and she's bad, like, the poet kind of gets it because it's her son. You know, like, yeah, yeah if, if your son's an outlaw, you still love your son, and you want his arm back. And, and, and all of that, but they will still kills her. Um, and then the dragon, where there's all kinds of issues with the dragon. One of the big problems is that the transition point that goes, then Beowulf ruled for 50 years and everything is wonderful. Um, <laughs> is the part of the manuscript that's the most damaged. Uh, I think, and I, I'm not original in this, that it, when the manuscript was left unbound sometime in the 1600s, um, or in the, sorry, in the 16th century, in the 1500s, it got wet on that page. And that Lawrence Noel, who owned it, tried to freshen it up to fix the faded writing. But whatever happened, it creates a huge confusion. It's hard to read. Some scholars think that it shows the poet going back and trying to rewrite the poem because it's kind of an awkward transition. You know, it's in 40 years and everything was great. But then a dragon showed up. But then the, the and, and also is it, there's a lot of stylistic like little quirks and is the dragon thing put together written later spliced on uh, hard all of these are big you know uh, technical problems that I've been working on for years and haven't solved yet but the dragon sort of works as like an evil king so if Grendel's an evil warrior and his mother's an evil avenger the dragon's an evil king. Because what are kings supposed to do? They're supposed to share out treasure. Comes across all the time. A good king shares his treasure, distributes treasure, gives treasure to thanes. Um, what does a dragon do? Sit on it. Gather it together. Refuse to let anything else have it. Become infuriated when someone uses it, touches it, you know, even steps near it or takes a cup. And um, 
and is just sort of this, you know, this, this evil force. Or the other way to look at this is that both Grendel and Grendel's mother attack for motivated reasons, right? Grendel attacks because he hates the sound of the harp or he represents the kin killing that you did in your house. His mother attacks for revenge. Beowulf, an outsider, comes in and cleans that up. But the dragon just comes out of nowhere. Yeah. And I think that that's, and Tolkien is suggesting this too, right? Like that's, that's the poet's point. It's not that the monsters are embarrassing or whatever. It's the monsters are representing sort of different types of horrible things that can happen to you. One is that you can earn your terrible fate because you killed your kin or you, you know, or you did a perfectly legitimate, you know, you killed the monster that ate everybody, but the monster's mother still shows up. There's that there's that, you know, in other words, it, it's, it's motivated not by anything wrong you did. So Grendel might be motivated by something you did wrong. Grendel's mother is still motivated, but not by you doing anything wrong, just by you having to survive. But the dragon, you did nothing wrong at all. You know, my metaphor for this or my comparison is you're a monk. You're weeding the garden in the island of Lindisfarne and you look up like, what are all those red sails over there? <laughs> or, you know, you're you're uh, working in the, you know, you're uh, cutting crudite in the windows of the world restaurant at the top of the World Trade Center and you hear a really loud airplane like that. That's what the dragon represents. The terrible, yeah. In, in the unstoppable bad Thing that comes out of nowhere that you didn't cause you had nothing to do with it and then so then what do you need you need a hero you can't just do it like as your culture or something and that's the role beowulf plays um and, and tolkien says he, he didn't fight like it wasn't a dragon fight to end all dragons it was just like i gotta kill that one dragon and then even at the end of the poem the 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 poet says has the mess a messenger say, well, now that Beowulf is dead, like all our enemies are going to come for us and we're going to be enslaved and uh, destroyed. So it doesn't even end on like, you know, you know, Beowulf is dead, but he was, you know, long live Beowulf or whatever. It's Beowulf is dead and we will be soon also. <laughs> and it says that's that's also an aesthetic accomplishment. You know, I mean, in that that way, like that's a pessimistic view, but that's sort of the the that post world war one view or maybe the post world war two view for that matter. Um, but reframe the way Tolkien does it. It says like, that's the Northern view within time, the monsters would win, but that didn't give you an excuse to quit. Yeah. It didn't make it useless because the monsters were going to win. It made it braver because you, you know, we're pretty sure you wouldn't win, but you still wouldn't give up. Yeah, and it matters that it matters that Beowulf doesn't make it out of that last one. Like the sometimes those the you know the the evils in life that you didn't that that came out of nowhere and that you didn't earn. You know, like you know, yeah, there's a certain type of problem that comes into your house and you got to fight it back. There's a different type of problem that keeps breeding problems. So you got Grendel and Grendel's mom, but sometimes it's just it's inevitable and then you fight and however good you however you know powerful you are in that battle or however much damage you do you don't make it out you're you're done for and that's that's the ultimate doom the end it is dark but it's meaningful i think and beowulf says like essentially you know he where he says he had his dark thoughts and he thought he might have offended god and he wished it it's very much what frodo says like i wish it had not happened in my time yeah and Gandalf's answer is, yeah, tough, you know, but it did. So does everybody. And, and that, that, and that's that. And I think actually, even though Beowulf is like, you know, a superhero with the strength of 30 and can swim underwater for a long time and fight sea monsters and everything, th there's something that's, that, that is still, I mean, Tolkien would probably say it's still English that Beowulf and Frodo have in common is just like, nope, not giving up. <laughs> or you yeah. could say, you know, also, right? Sam's like, yeah, yeah, I know it's hopeless. Still not, not giving up. And, and you see that in, in Viking, a lot of Viking literature too. Oh, you're, you're hopelessly beaten. You know, we're going to kill all of you. Why don't you surrender? And the Viking's like, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Even if we're going to end up dead. And in the end, in the long run, that kind of persistence, I mean, it reminds me of, um, the end of the Princess Bride, right? Where, 
Inigo Montoya, right, has been deceitfully stabbed, and and what's his, uh, you know, uh, the, count the uh, count. Yeah, oh, I'm count. blanking too. <laughs> yeah. Christopher Guest. Christopher Guest, right? He's saying like, <laughs> "Why won't you die?" And then he just keeps going. Yeah, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. And repeating it, and repeating it. Like you know, I mean, the trope is right. It's like the uh, the uh, determinator. I think is the TV trope's phrase for that. Like you know, you just <laughs> I'm not giving up. Yeah, you could beat me. I'm still not giving up. But Tolkien thought that was the proper response. Um, and, and in a way he even like fits this in with his theological framework. He's like, that's the only response that you could have pre Christianity because old Norse religion and old, you know, whatever the Anglo Saxons believed in before Christianity told you that the gods were going to lose. So, you know, it's only when you got Christianity, like, but that's okay. If all this happens, you'll still get heaven. You'll still get the, the, the healed world. And after the day of judgment, but before that, you know, he said it was grim, but they kept on. And, and he dramatizes that with the, I, mean, I think the elves and the, you know, all the, the various characters in, um, the Silmarillion and, you know, just that, that refusal to, to quit, which is, I think, one of the things we love about those characters. Yeah, I'm a, I'm such a sucker for stories like that. And I think it, you know, it was one of the reasons I fell so much in love with the, you know, the Norse Eddas and then, and then, you know, well, you know, Tolkien as well. Um, but Beowulf, but all the way down to even when it's, even when it's like grittier and everything from, I don't know, Punisher on Netflix to <laughs> even when it's done badly in some other shows. I mean, it's just that, that kind of, that grim determination and, and never giving up and then losing. I don't know. I mean, that's Rocky as well too, <laughs> but well, it's a, uh, you throw monsters in it, it elevates. So. so usually, and then Hollywood turns it around and you, you do all that and then you get rewarded for it. Right. Oh, yeah, then you get a yeah. win. Um, and, and that's, what's so fascinating about the way Tolkien, you know, just the, the plotting of the Lord of the Rings, his genius there is yes, the good guys win, but an enormous price is paid and it's not one in like the mono a mono with the bad guy. Yeah. It's the, it's, you know, it's for Frodo's mercy to Gollum and just the working out of fate. In fact, you could, I've made a case that the only kind of like archetypical hero fights monster to the death one-on-one -on -one is Eowyn versus the Lord of the Nazgul. Yeah, that's true. That's the only one. You know, high, like, dressed, you know, in disguise and, in fact, doesn't even really, at that point, doesn't even sort of, who, it's funny because she, right, she has gone looking for heroism and, and everything, but then she's decided she just wants to die. And then at that moment, she's like, I just want to avenge Theoden. Like, I'm going to smite you if you touch him. And it's, it's really great how Tolkien sets that up, right? Because there's this horrible monster that I guess he would almost be as good a monster as the Balrog or maybe even better. They're, you know, the, the witch king of Angmar. And, and he says, you know, do not try to hinder me, uh, or no living man may hinder me. And Eowyn laughs. And again, like, I love, I love Miranda Otto. I love how she did that in the Peter Jackson movie. I also love, the the way Tolkien does it, which probably wouldn't work as well out loud when he says, no living man. And she's like, well, no man am I, which yeah. couldn't work out loud. And then I also think, like, what if, like, Carrie Fisher had been cast as Eowyn? <laughs> would be very different, but you'd still get it. You know, he would say, no living man may, may hinder me. And she'd be like, this is just not your lucky day. <laughs> Look around. Look at this giant battle site. There's not a woman here except for me. What are the odds, Lord of the Nazgul? You know, <laughs> and it would, um, you know, that would have been a good way of doing it too. But, but then again, like the way she she does that, she's not like, she's not even like, you know, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. She's still saying, just don't touch his body. She gives him like every chance to retreat, and then she stabs him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I love that scene. I love the way Miranda Otto plays it in, in Peter Jackson, but it's the, it's, that's the only one. Like Gandalf goes against the Balrog, but as far as, 
the, at the time that you see it happen, you think he lost. Yeah. Right? I guess where would you get when Aragorn, like, stabs the, like, the Moria orc, brings Andril down on his helmet and a white flame came up? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's just little skirmishes, but most of the time it's running away. <laughs> and what then, what happens off, off screen, yeah. right? Like, Boromir's great battle happens and nobody sees it. Um, uh, it's, right, when it says that Aim, when Aemir uh, kills a Gluck, that happens off screen. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. they, they even, I mean, love the way Tolkien does this, right? The apophasis thing, like, uh, I'm not going to tell you what I just told you. So he's <laughs> like, yeah, they didn't even see when Aemir dismounted and fought with Ugluck and chopped his head off. And, yeah. Uh, and that's, that's part of Tolkien's just, his genius was for someone who was not like, you know, like when I say a professional novelist, like someone who would publish a lot of novels and get a lot of feedback and, you know, or, or work in screenwriting or something like that and have audience response. I mean, he did have from the Inklings and C.S. Lewis, but he, he just, you know, had assimilated the tradition so well that he knew exactly what to keep off stage, off, off the page in your brain and to, to connect with our theme of monsters. That's why, like, the monsters are terrifying because they're confusing. The Black Riders are scary because you don't know what the heck they are for the whole first part. Yeah. You know, uh, or, you know, you have an idea. They're the servants of the ring, but it, it builds the watcher in the water. What even is that? Yeah, you know, it it's scared got, the hell out of me. <laughs> right. And, and even then, and then there's all these other things that are just hinted at. Like, um, there's the watcher in the water. What the heck is the thing that, that hammers in Moria? Yeah, we it, never know. We never find out. I mean, right? we can. It wasn't a. The, it doesn't make sense that it would be the Balrog or or no, anything. No, well, the Balrog hammering something like yeah, it doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. Um, and then there's also the the uh, the there are nameless things that I will not trouble the light of day by reporting that Gandalf says. Like that sounds pretty scary if Gandalf is creeped out by them, and. Uh, just so many pieces like that, whatever, you know, as we go through the old forest and we don't really know about Willow Man yet, it's just all scary. And, um, you know, that, that kind of, uh, building and certainly like all the things that you imagine are just off the road in Mordor or Ithilien, uh, you know, where there's that, the remains of the horrible feast, right? Where there are bodies that had seemed to be cooked. And I think I, most of us assume they're orcs, but do we know that? I don't, I don't think we do. And that, and that's like part of, I think I read it in Stephen King's Dance Macabre once where he said the problem is if you show someone a 30 foot tall praying mantis, instead of being terrified of the 30 foot tall praying mantis, like if it's in, it's in a film or if it's in a book, they'll be like, oh, well, at least it wasn't a 50 foot tall praying mantis. <laughs> And yeah, that's right. Careful, you know, and Tolkien, I, like, so the, what we started with the description of the Balrog, he's brilliant at that. Like, you don't even really know what it looks like. Yeah. And, and on that note, I've got, the, there's been one, the one question in Beowulf that's been troubling me for years, and I can't, I either can't get a straight answer out of anybody, or I, I'm never satisfied with it. But, I mean, it might seem pedestrian, but not to me. Are you going to ask how big the dragon is? <laughs> no, no. I'm, I mean, my my question might even be simpler than that, but I can't ever get a straight answer out of anybody, so I'm going to corner you. What the hell did Grendel look like? I mean, was uh, he hairy? Was he a troll? Was he Shrek? Was he scales? We know he has well, a, a, at least one arm or had one and a <laughs> mouth and claws, and I think that's all we know. He has, he has nails that are like iron. Right. And I did a, I did a big dive into what the word nail meant, whether like a fingernail came first or like a, you know, a, uh, or the nail, like the thing you, you know, hammer in came first. And the answer is actually that animal claw is where nail comes from, huh. uh, originally. And then by analogy, it's both a human claw and the thing you, you hammer in. So that was not helpful, uh, cause it already describes it as being like a claw. Right. And it's, it's, it's large, but it doesn't really say how large. It doesn't quite say how big Grendel is, though he has a dragon skin bag that's large enough to put Beowulf in. So I guess we should assume that Grendel's a little bit bigger than even a really big guy like Beowulf. 
Um, on the other hand, I mean, how large can he be? He kind of forces his way through the door into Herod, seems to fill the door. Um, and he eats Beowulf's companion right in front of Beowulf. And if we're really supposed to like read that scene as, you know, like a, a just a straight description, he's going to have a huge mouth. Yeah. Because otherwise that's going to take an hour or more. <laughs> I mean, you know, I've watched National Geographic. I know how long it takes lions to eat, you know, a zebra. <laughs> or um, so like, you know, that, that he like just gulped him down in huge morsels. You kind of then picture like a lion sized mouth or something on him. Though if that's the case, why doesn't he just bite Beowulf in the face as opposed to running away when Beowulf grabs his arm? Like, yeah. it's very hard to figure out Grendel. It's also hard, like, the way that, that Grendel's immunity to weapons gets stuck in there, where it's at the last minute. It's like, oh, and by the way, he had four sworn weapons. And it's always, always translated as he had uh, bewitched or enchanted the weapons. But huh. every other place in Anglo-Saxon where forsworn is used, it means renounced. Like we use it, like I had forsworn, you know, the use of uh, atomic weapons or something like that. And so what does this actually mean? What does Grendel look like? Um, you know, him and his mother are in the relationship of a man to a woman, but they're monsters. So that could just be proportional. But on the other hand, with if the monster does sit on Beowulf, she can't be that big. Yeah. Right. But if it's just she set upon Beowulf, then that's like a slightly different, you know, a, a different story. So, I mean, I think if you had to put together like a consensus of Grendel, I would say that probably about like 10 to 14 feet tall, um, maybe a little smaller, um, you know, very large, strong arms, a gigantic mouth. Uh, but yet, on the other hand, he's supposed to be able to cast spells. Does he talk in a language? Like it's not at all clear uh, why. And I think that's again, because I think the poet is sort of deliberately or not thinking all the way through, like reworking some folktale motifs. And I, I really do. Like if I had to guess something behind Beowulf, it's that Beowulf, Grendel's mother is some kind of necromancer. Uh, and I'm getting this from Tolkien's Beowulf translation, too. He has some hints here and there that the mother was originally a Halia Runas, which are all female, by the way, some kind of uh, witches, gothic, um, terrifying people that do things with the dead. And that Grendel is possibly some kind of corpse reanimated by her. And if that's the, the case, then you can, you know, or maybe he's a little bit larger in, in that sense. But the poet, for whatever reason, doesn't want that exactly. Like he doesn't want necromant ne necromancy, though he uses that word Holly ruin us. Um, he like which really translates as hell secrets, knowers of hell secrets or something. Um, but he doesn't want that pagan stuff in there. And so he turns them into just like, you know, raw trolls rather than <laughs> um, something something else. But that's, I mean, by the way, like other Anglo-Saxons would be like, oh, there you go, drought. That's so far out there. Um, but it's just, it's really, it's really hard. Uh, there's a lot of problems in Beowulf. It, the, the problem is that the scribes who copied it didn't perfectly understand what they were copying. And their method of copying was to copy word for word, or as, as Lenny Neidorf says, um, lexeme for lexeme. And if they saw a word that wasn't familiar to them, they converted it into the one that something that was more familiar. So like they spell Kane's name wrong twice. <laughs> right. But we know it's Kane or we think it's Kane because the next line says he who slew Abel, which would kind of narrow it down. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and like lots of Aemer, whose name you may know from <laughs> as the ride of the Rohirrim. Um, Aemer shows up in Beowulf, but he's Yeomor, which means mournful. So like the, the scribe didn't even realize it was a name. And there's a lot of other things like that. And, and Tolkien was brilliant at figuring him out. There's another problem when there's like, uh, something like the word, uh, Grunan shows up in the manuscript, which isn't even an Anglo-Saxon word. And so the scribe tries to fix it and makes it Gruman, but it still doesn't quite make sense. And Tolkien figured out, and this only came out in the Beowulf translation, like his Beowulf translation, it should be Grima, which would be mask. Um, 
And that would be like what armor someone's wearing. No, he doesn't have a fierce face. He has a mask on. And if you know the Beowulf, like the Sutton Who helmet that's always associated with Beowulf, it looks like a mask. Yeah. So Tolkien, and I think he's a hundred percent right on that one. He's, it, it all fits together. But because of, because of those confusions and, and at some point, I think one of the copyists or someone, you know, decided to stick some extra bits in Beowulf. So, there's a point where it says the Danes at times they made sacrifices at the pagan temple. Um, such was their, they worshiped the spirit slayer and so forth. And then the poem suddenly goes, woe will it be to those who go to the devil and need to be embraced in fire forever, but well will it be who embraces God. And it's like, where the heck did that come from? <laughs> There's nothing like it in all the rest of Beowulf. And my interpretation is that when Beowulf was originally written in the eighth century, there were no pagans in England anymore. Like the whole country was converted, right, uh, by 660 or so. And certainly, so by 750, like not even anyone's grandfather was still pagan. So you could say, yeah, at times they made sacrifices at the pagan temple, those fools and so forth. But when the poem was recopied at the end of the 10th century, there were pagans living down the street. There were Vikings who'd invaded and were living in pagan Viking villages all over England. And so the poet felt like, yeah, they made sacrifices at the pagan temple. And that was wrong. It was wrong. Don't do it. <laughs> uh, just because oh. of a different context. And if I'm right about this, and, and, you know, if Beowulf really is this incredibly like layered, modified text over with, with folktale roots going back into the oral tradition and with changes right before the manuscript copy or even when it was being copied, then it's just really hard to tell. And it's also hard to know, like, whose vision do you use? You know, what does what does Grendel look like? Well, to a 10th century thing, he looks like a Cyclops or something. And to a 7th century one, he's a water demon. And there's a there's a Jenny Greenteeth or Peg Powler in, in Grendel's uh, mother. No, no, it's the devil uh, from, you know, the Visio Pauli. That's what makes it. And I, and I think that that's what makes it a, a remarkable uh, piece of literature like that, that you have to put so much into it means that it continually ends up maybe not by design of the original author who would just like want to tell a story or whatever, but it ends up adapting and, and fitting into each cultural moment in which it's read as well as where it came from. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's cool. I am, I am less frustrated <laughs> now that I don't know what Grendel looks like. <laughs> Cause I don't know like... at all there. Uh, I will say the dragon is supposed to be only 50 feet long. Uh, so not like the size of Peter Jackson's Smaug, like not like a 747. Uh, <laughs> and also I, I always, I have trouble with this. Beowulf's fighting the dragon. And then it says the dragon bit him in the neck. So he got the poison in his neck. The dragon's head has to be very small if that's the case. Because if it's like a T-Rex, I can't see any way that he can get bitten in the neck and it doesn't just take his head off. Yeah, it would have to be a graze, <laughs> I guess, or oh. or it's a or it's a really long snake, I guess. I and right, and that's what I think it is. I think it's like a long snake with wings. Because yeah. when the um the when the the Babel's people push it off the cliff, it could be as few as 12 of them there. So I'm picturing like, like a python head, you know, with sharp teeth and fire, of course, but not like the full, you know, giant dinosaur dragon. Um, and in fact, if you look at Tolkien's original drawing of like the Smaug on the Horde, that's about the size of that Smaug. Because you can see where Bilbo would be and where the, the pot of gold is and everything. And Smaug's not like, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch Smaug. Yeah. I mean, nor would it have to be that big to really give you problems. Like when I ran into a snake in my yard that was only three feet long and I'm fighting it with a sword for like three minutes and I'm scared to death and worn out afterward and I have to stress nap. Uh, you know, if it were just six feet long, it, I, it would have done me in, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I made a, I made a, a meme out of this that had, um, I don't know if you, so you know, the, the, uh, Gadsden flag that don't tread on me, yeah. uh, some, uh, Soldiers in Afghanistan and, and stuff had made a variant of it with the bright yellow flag and a really poorly drawn like S that looked like a snake. And then it says no step on snake as like, <laughs> you know, like the mean bad spelling animal joke. 
right? So <laughs> I adapted that by writing because uh, in Beowulf it says that the uh, thief went into the barrow and missed stepping on the dragon's head by the width of a foot. So I put that quote in Old English, and then I put the picture of Smaug burning uh, Lake Town to the ground, and just wrote, "No step on snack." <laughs> I like that. But yeah, like, you know, and, and we are, we are like wired to be, uh, you know, to react really strongly to anything that's a serpent yeah. shape, just scare people. And if it had wings and flew, <laughs> forget about it. <laughs> so I will point out that, um, there's more historical support for flying wing, flying fire breathing dragons than there is for King Beowulf. Because the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle for the a year in the in the 500 says uh, that year fly, uh, fiery dragons were seen flying over Northumbria, and that's a historical text. And uh, Beowulf's name never shows up in any historical text. So the dragon is, uh, by some historian standards, more historical than Beowulf himself. Oh my God, I'm going to quote you on that probably yeah, every I, week I, for the I rest of my life. Answers. Yeah, um, there's documentation of the dragon, no documentation of King Beowulf. That is awesome. Oh, <laughs> man. So we have, we now know here on the Monster Professor for sure that we have <laughs> we have all the historical evidence we need, at least more. So that's cool. Man, you've, been, you've been so generous with your time. I'm well past 40-ish minutes or so with you. And so I uh, I, I thank you a lot. And, I'm, and maybe at this point we should let listeners know, like, where can they find out more about you if, if they if they don't? already know where should they go to find out what well, michael drought's up to if um if i get my websites updated um <laughs> then michaeldrought.com but um i am on twitter sometimes as just mike drought at you know at, at mike drought um i'm at wheaton college easy to find that way and books and um i've done 13 audio courses for um, recorded books that are available on audio that you, uh, you can get that from audible or from um, Amazon. And I think that, yeah, that would be the best way until I, I started working on my websites uh, again this summer and really just ended up breaking all of them and need to, need to just <laughs> need to just bite the bullet and hire one of my students and be like, okay, I am no longer able to like great vintage 2007 hand coded websites, you know, <laughs> but I mean, I don't have the little biplane going across the top, but it's pretty much at that level. Uh, <laughs> I need to fix that up, but it was a real pleasure um, talking with you and, and, and talking about, um, you know, about monsters and Beowulf and Tolkien. I mean, as you can tell, I could go on about this stuff forever. And considering that actually I taught Beowulf today in, in a, in my Beowulf seminar, I kind of am <laughs> not running out of stuff. So, um. well, that's fantastic. I, 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 re I really enjoyed it. Learned a lot. And I think listeners are going to love it. So thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, also, uh, so that maybe this is off the podcast part that you can keep it. I really like the article about Dracula and um, the ring rates, like a lot. Well, it's thank you, man. <laughs> like, I, I, I just, one of these things that, that you go like, I wish I had done that because you just laid it out and it works beautifully. And of course he, I mean, I guess we can't prove he'd read it, but he'd read it. He'd been to Whitby for God's sakes. Uh, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's excellent. And I, I, uh, one of my colleagues is a Victorianist who teaches Dracula all the time. And I told her about it and, and, uh, she, she loved it as a way to interface. So once the, we get the actual article out. I will, she'll probably give it to the students in the uh, Dracula class as a nice connection between. So really pleasure. That was a pleasure to read. Thank you so much. That's awesome. When, uh, um, when I was getting an email from Verlin um, and she was like, here's some notes from the editors. I'm like, I don't know who the editors were, but I wonder if Michael Drought read it. <laughs> so, oh, definitely. Well, all, of so. us, all of us read. Um, so me, uh, Bratman and um, Verlin, we read everything. And then we send it out to a, 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 an external person. So you got feedback from at least four people mixed in in one way or another. Well, that's all. Well, I really appreciate you saying so, man. That's, <laughs> uh, um, and so 
I, and I don't know, maybe I can have you again on the podcast at some point in the future, though I'll give you plenty of time to rest up and, and then I'll, uh, and plenty of time for me to come up with more puzzling questions that you can, that you can answer and set my mind at ease about it. <laughs> so. Absolutely. It would be, it would be fun. This was, this was great. It was a, it was a real pleasure. 